They're seeing their industry crumble in a way that they haven't seen before. Last year, there were a little bit over 10,000 layoffs in the video game industry. 5,000 of those were through Embracer Group, which is significant. In a similar move, Microsoft ended up laying off 1,900 Activision and Xbox employees. It's really, really hard for the people that have been laid off to find new jobs. Um, they're in this pool now that if we're counting last year, 20,000 people were laid off um, in total from last year to right now in a year and a half. People are unable to pay rent. They live in cities that they relocated to for these jobs, cities that are very, very expensive. They have families, they have medical conditions, they're losing their health care. Let's focus on the human aspect of this because I think this is really important. These mergers and acquisitions always result in employee layoffs and employees getting stiffed because the shareholders got to get theirs. If the company does not increase in profit, it still makes profit, but the, the profit margin the, the profit margins don't increase. The shareholders are upset, right? They don't get to add on to their yacht. But the employee, if they get laid off, they lose their house. They lose their apartment. They can't afford to pay their electric bill. They can't afford food. There once was a young man named JB. And JB was a, a an inquisitive kid, a kid that loved video games growing up. And as a child, JB, I'm speaking in third person, lived in near or poverty level growing up. So whenever I would go to friends' houses or to family's houses, you know, the kids there would have either a Sega, a Sega typically a Sega Genesis, or a Nintendo or Super Nintendo. And it always fascinated me, but we couldn't afford it. Until one day, my mom was able to get me a Super Nintendo. And by that time, everybody else was getting a Sony PlayStation. So pretty much, I was always behind in the video game market. So I remember having my first Nintendo having the Super Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt combo. I know, I look good for my age. And then I quickly graduated to Super Nintendo, right? In fact, I got the little compact Super Nintendo preloaded right now over there with the Super Mario World and, you know, Zelda and all that. Anyway. And as I've gotten older, video games have progressed and video games have gotten better in graphics. They've gotten better uh, in storylines and, and, and it's complexity. Video games are now just playable movies now, right? You can, you can say it like that. But another thing that we've noticed, especially those of us that have gotten older, people, especially those of us who are millennials, is that the quality of these said games have actually deteriorated over time. You ask any gamer, any gamer, right? My boyfriend's a gamer, right? A lot of them have said, well, there are some definite things that you've seen where the quality has gone down as well as you've seen more of a cash grab, right? DLCs, anyone? Uh, so when it comes to video games, even though it is one of the biggest pastimes of many of us here in the United States, a lot of us are noticing the greed from big corporations in this. So one of the things I want to do is I actually want to go into this particular uh, video that actually talks about the greed of video games. 
And it really, it's, it's more of, you know, not just a reaction, but this is more of me talking about why uh, they, they kind of dance around cap saying this capitalism, but ultimately the problem is capitalism and I can explain why. So let's get into it. So this is out of more perfect union. This was actually a really good video. And, uh, it says new corporate greed is killing the video game industry. Investors flock to flock to buy up video game studios during the pandemic. Now they're laying off thousands of workers and we're getting glitchier games, delayed resource releases that and favors few and fewer workers forced to put in inhumane hours. So I want to get into this. Let's start. If you've played a video game the last year, you've probably seen something like this. Vampires in Red Pole floating aimlessly in the sky, Starfield characters missing faces, and Hogwarts Legacy Wizards falling through the ground into nothingness. While I can admit glitches and bugs can be hilarious, they've also left me wondering, is this the new standard? Then, just this January, one of my favorite series, Deus Ex, a franchise that arguably transformed gaming when it was released in 2000, got canceled out of nowhere. And Deus Ex is not alone. In the last year, unprecedented numbers of games have been canceled, workers laid off, and studios shuttered. The teams that make Saints Row, Red Faction, and Deus Ex have all lost their jobs. Even studios that make huge games like Tomb Raider and Borderlands are being hit with downsizing. Now, you're probably thinking, Alec, there is a very simple reason for all of this. The economy is rough, video game sales are down, and tons of industries are laying people off. Do these companies have any other option besides tightening their belts or shutting down? This is the 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 excuse is always given. Well, we gotta tighten our belts. Uh, times are hard, you know. The economy, inflation, you know. We we just can't, we we gotta let some of these people go. And then in letting people go, what ends up happening is the quality of the product diminishes. And when the product, product quality diminishes, people start to make excuses for the corporations. Well, you know, the economy, uh, inflation, blah, 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 blah. But is that really the actual issue? Well, it kind of gets debunked. So let's continue. I decided to find out for myself because things just weren't adding up. I mean, in 2023, American consumers spent $57 billion on video games alone. So I started digging and I discovered it is not the result of a tough economy. In fact, that's just a helpful cover story for what's really going on. To understand the present grim reality of the video game industry, we have to go back to the start of the pandemic. 2020 was a huge year for video games as people were locked inside their homes Game sales skyrocketed. They skyrocketed so much, in fact, that investors started eyeing the industry as their next great cash cow. So this reminds me of the big boom in sites like Grubhub, DoorDash, Uber Eats, Postmates, right? We were all locked inside because of this raging pandemic that was happening outside of our doors. And then we were like, we're home. We don't have much to do. So things that we need to do to occupy our time at home, like video games, go up exponentially. I would also say the use of audiobooks have went up. The buying of books have went up. Amazon sales jumped because everybody had to deliver their stuff home, right? Look, even sex toys went up. Went, went up. You know what I mean? And people were bored. It all went up, right? Because people were at home and they had to occupy their time. How many people bought more subscriptions to Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus, uh, Amazon Prime, all these things that 
were are centered around being home go up. And so, of course, the sales would go up. So when people go, oh, we're, we're tightening our belt. But y'all have record profits. How can you be tightening your belt when you're getting fatter? You know what I'm saying? You, you, you got more. You got bigger. So let's continue. 2021 is where you see the massive investment. When you look at a chart, it's like 2020, 2019, 2021. It's, it's wild. All those franchises hit by layoffs or closures I mentioned a bit ago, one thing ties them together. A huge video game conglomerate called Embracer Group. Emboldened by this once in a lifetime market, Embracer Group bought up studio after studio, including many I've already mentioned, makers of Borderlands, Tomb Raider, Deus Ex. They even bought the company that owns the board game Settlers of Catan. And the workers at Embracer Studios were kind of excited. I would say that it was a more positive uh, reception. That's Alex, a former mission designer at Embracer-owned Volition Games, which made Saints Row. Embracer wasn't the only studio with this business plan. Microsoft merged with Activision in 2022 and has been on its own consolidation push. The biggest companies with the most sustainability and diversified revenue streams are buying up as much of the industry as they possibly can, seemingly in order to buy up talent and to buy up IP so that they can spin that off into as many profitable ventures as possible. That's That sounds bad. Remember when I talked about the mergers and acquisitions of Temper Sealy trying to buy up Mattress Firm, right? I talked about that last week, right? The goal in capitalism is for corporations that what a small handful of people or one person owns the entire means of production. The goal is to grow infinitely as much as you possibly can. The duty of the CEO, the chief executive officer, it has a they have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders. It's even written into law. You have to do that. Meaning year over year, you have to grow. No matter what, you have to keep growing. That growth means one of the things you have to do is to merge or acquire your competition. And that's what's been happening is that these video game companies have been merging and acquiring as much of the competition as possible. But what happens when you merge and acquire the competition? That means there's less competition, meaning less innovation. And less innovation means who suffers? Well, it is the workers who suffer as well as the consumer, you who suffers. And so because of this, that's how capitalism works because it requires infinite growth on a planet with finite resources. I want to repeat that again, capitalism, not commerce, capitalism requires infinite growth on a planet with finite resources. I want people to remember capitalism and commerce are not the same thing. So people will be like, well, you have to buy and sell. That's capitalism. No, 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 baby, that's, com that's commerce, okay? Capitalism is about the ownership and who owns what, right? Commerce is about the process of buying and selling. Okay? All right, so let's get back into this. That's Colin, a game developer who did not work for Embracer, but has a unique claim to fame. I was laid off twice in one year, yes. The big thing about game companies is when they become bigger, there is a certain amount of growth that those shareholders are expecting. And to achieve that growth, 
Game companies do a few things. They'll buy up studios to achieve a greater market share. They'll rush games that have no business being released at the expense of inhumane working hours for their staff. So the first things, two things he said is buying up companies to increase market share. That's a part of capitalism, right? So we already talked about that. But then also they're either cutting workers or they are pushing workers to the brink to get these games out. And sometimes these games are not even finished. And then in, in order to increase the, the value that they that you have to purchase these games for, they will purposely keep them incomplete. And then they will offer DLCs, which are downloadable content in order for you to purchase more than the game. So let's say hypothetically, I should have brought one of my games out, but let's say hypothetically you got uh, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, right? Which came out uh, earlier this year, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. But let's say they also have a DLC. So now you spent $70, $70 for that game. But then the DLC is another 20. That means you just spent $90 on the game. But then they have another DLC that comes out and you may have to spend $10. So now you're spending $100 in that game. And then another DLC comes out and another DLC comes out and another DLC comes out. You see, you see how they're, they're squeezing you dry just on one game. All because they didn't finish. All because they want to just get as much out of you as possible. That's capitalism. And then, and then the quality of the game is crap or nowhere near where it should be. Let's continue. They'll cram in as many microtransactions as possible or chase whatever new monetization strategy the competitor is doing. The video came out. Uh, that's another thing, uh, the microtransactions. So if you want a certain skin or a certain little feature that you don't necessarily have on the games, well, guess what? They're going to charge for that. And it may be that skin for that particular character may be only be 99 cents, a dollar. But then you get another skin and another skin and another skin and another piece and another piece and another piece. And next thing you know, you spent 50 extra dollars on a game. You spend 60 to 70 dollars on a game and you spend another 50 dollars in the game. You're spending upwards of 110, 120 dollars for a game. Millennials, come here for a second. Remember when video games were 60, 70 dollars, but then you bought the game and that was it. You didn't have any DLCs. You didn't have to download or buy anything else in order to have the game. You just had to play the game and maybe you would earn certain points in the game and then you get new features in the game. But after that, that was it. Even though the game prices technically are still the same, they're not. Because what they do is they keep the game incomplete and then you end up spending double than what you were would on the game. So in actuality, you're spending between $110 and $140 for a brand new game when you factor in the DLCs and the microtransactions. That's how much it costs us now. But they're giving you games that are incomplete. Mm -mm -mm. It's sad. It's really sad transactions as possible or chase whatever new monetization strategy a competitor is doing. The video game industry consolidation is leading to less risk. You're going to see less games that do new things that are engaging with new ideas. These gaming conglomerates are taking a page from Hollywood by milking established franchises for all they're worth. Well so you how many Street Fighters have we had? How many Final Fantasies? Look, we're, uh, we're about to embark on, what, the 17th Final Fantasy now? Right? Which is kind of technically an anthology series, but still. How many different um, 
Resident Evils do we need? You know, it, and, and this is something I've talked to with a lot of people. When it comes to capitalism, the goal is risk aversion while maximizing profits. Meaning, you want to take less risks so that you won't lose that much money. This is why we have a Star Wars Episode 7, 8, and 9. This is why we had to come out with an Ocean's 8. Oh, no, sorry, Ocean's, yeah, I think it was Ocean's 8. After we did 11, 12, and 13. This is why we're coming out with part two, part three, part four, part five, remake after remake of the same stories. Why? Because they don't want to put more risk into new things because new things may flop. And if they flop, then guess what? You lose that money. Some of the best stories, some of the best franchises we have ever seen in entertainment have come from risks. Star Wars was a risk. Harry Potter was a risk. The MCU, the Marvel Cinematic Universe was a risk. How many people were real fans of Iron Man before 2008? How many people were actually following him? How many people were, were fans of Thor? <laughs> they have to risk is what actually helps create that actual fanfare. That actual like, oh my God, this is something new, something novel, something we have never seen before. But unfortunately, because capitalists want to retain as much profit as they possibly can, they don't want to risk in new stories. Therefore, they're going to recycle the same thing over and over and over again. This is why Star Wars Episode 7, The Force Awakens, is basically a carbon copy of Star Wars Episode 4, A New Hope. You'll never get anything really, truly new because they don't want to risk it. Like, for, for instance, The Incredibles. Great movie. Technically, it's based on the Fantastic Four, but it was a great story. But they're going to recycle The Incredibles. They're going to do a third one and then a fourth one and the fifth one, probably, because they're going to keep it as a cash cow. But they don't want to focus on anything new. And then they'll have spinoffs, you know. And that'll be that. So. The holding of shareholders, it's not enough to make a game that makes some money and pays its workers and leadership a decent wage. Shareholders expect constant growth. In other words, mm -hmm. an unsustainable return on investment. Mm -hmm. Things didn't start unraveling for Embracer until 2022. Honestly, we didn't hear about the $2 billion deal until it fell through. Embracer is a publicly traded company, but one particular investment partner helped continue their industry consolidation. Embracer Group had a $1 billion investment from Savvy Games Group. Savvy Games Group, for the record, is a giant in the gaming space. They bought huge stakes in EA, Take-Two Interactive, and spent over $4 billion alone to buy a mobile game company called Scopely. They're also an arm of the public investment fund the wealth fund for Saudi Arabia's royal family. Hmm. Savvy's billion dollar investment in Embracer happened in June of 2022. And shortly after, Embracer spent $395 million on the rights to Lord of the Rings and bought another round of studios looking to grow their portfolio for their investors. Savvy Games Group intended to invest another $2 billion in there and that fell through. Up until late last night, we had an amazing cash flow. I think that's history now, so it's not that relevant. 
for undisclosed reasons, the deal with Savvy Games imploded, and Embracer's shopping spree was suddenly looking like a huge mistake. But hey, this is business, and, and uh, I know shareholders and other stakeholders expect me to win every battle. This was a big one. And um, we didn't win this one, but I'm sure we will win uh, many of the future battles. And, and so this is business. This is how it goes. This is capitalism. We have to do. Look, we have to do what we have to do. You know, we have to. We hire too many people, then we have to let them off. It's this is business. We had a big cash flow. Now we have to let them go. So yeah. <laughs> and uh that's where Embracer went bad. We got like a an email at like nine oh five or something for an eleven o'clock all hands meeting. The people from Gearbox, thankfully, just rip off the band-aid and we're like, yep, uh, we're closing the studio. One of the guys who I think worked there since Volition opened was like, well, that's 30 years down the drain. It's hard to watch the thing you've been a part of for, you know, it, probably a majority of his life uh, just get destroyed and through no fault of his own. People who have been laid off from Embracer and elsewhere are devastated. They're seeing their industry crumble in a way that they haven't seen before. Last year, there were a little bit over 10,000 layoffs in the video game industry. 5,000 of those were through Embracer Group, which is significant. In a similar move, Microsoft ended up laying off 1,900 Activision and Xbox employees. It's really, really hard for the people that have been laid off to find new jobs. Um, they're in this pool now that if we're counting last year, 20,000 people were laid off um, in total from last year to right now in a year and a half. People are unable to pay rent. They live in cities that they relocated to for these jobs, cities that are very, very expensive. They have families. They have medical conditions. They're losing their health care. Let's focus on the human aspect of this, because I think this is really important. These mergers and acquisitions always result in employee layoffs and employees getting stiffed because the shareholders got to get theirs. If the company does not increase in profit, it still makes profit, but the, the profit margin the, the profit margins don't increase, the shareholders are upset, right? They don't get to add on to their yacht. But the employee, if they get laid off, they lose their house. They lose their apartment. They can't afford to pay their electric bill. They can't afford food. They lose their car. So see the risk compared between an investor or a shareholder and a worker? And so when you go down the line to these corporate parasites, they only see you as a number on a sheet. And so then it goes, well, let's lay off the ones who are performing, you, the ones who we need to lay off. Sometimes it's due to performance. Sometimes it's just like who they can trim the fat and save the most money from. And also, a lot of people don't talk about this, about the workers who still remain. Because let's say you have a team of 20 on a particular project. And then they end up laying off half of those people they're not going to hire on another 10. That means that you're going to have to do double the work for the same pay. That's how capitalism works. And now they're going to be running on skeleton crews, expecting you to do the same job that it took 20 people to do that now 10 have to do. 
And do you think that the quality of said game would be just as good done in that same amount of time? families. They have medical conditions. They're losing their health care. During the height of the pandemic, people like me, we use social distancing as an excuse to 100% Pokemon Snap or perfect our Animal Crossing island. They may have even convinced a few friends to pick up a game for the first time in years. Of course that wouldn't last. I still have not completed Pokemon Snap, and my Steam library is overflowing with games I don't have time to play anymore. Any executive who actually understands business knew this was a bubble and could see this happening. And I think it, in the most generous reading possible, receded more than they thought it would. But I don't think a single person who ramped up a ton of hiring during the pandemic thought that they wouldn't have to lay off a single person. Whether you're angry about laid off workers, canceled games, or prematurely released games, Lars Wingafors, CEO of Embracer, laid out the logic behind it all. Our overruling principle is to always maximize shareholder value in any given situation. Shareholder value. Meaning, their dividend checks matter more than your life. That's it. And every single time we talk about corporate profits, especially in the realms of capitalism, people go, well, that's just the nature of business. It doesn't have to be, though. Or some people will say, well, that's that's just that's just corporate greed. That's not capitalism. That's not real capitalism. No, no baby, that's real capitalism. Because capitalism is about who owns what, not about commerce. So when it comes to capitalism and who owns what they don't care about the real people who are actually making the product the people who actually really run the company because ultimately it's about how much money they're getting on that dividend check workers be damned I think the goal of maximizing quarterly profits is really the death of any artistic industry. Mm. And that view on it where we have to absolutely maximize profit is the thing that is eating us alive right now. One thing that kept coming up as I spoke to journalists and game developers is the question of institutional knowledge. The industry has for years been laying off workers once a game is completed. But some of the most revered games, like Elden Ring, Tears of the Kingdom, are made by studios that hang on to its workers, game after game, sequel after sequel. And I'd argue it shows. In my first layoff, now you've got 80 people who lost 40 people who now need to fill in all of those gaps among themselves and can't hire to fill those slots. So you're either going to need to make a smaller project, a completely different project, or severely cut scope and even then, you might not have all the tools that you had previously because now you've got giant knowledge gaps amongst your team. With this recent round of layoffs being so severe, the problem won't just be that an experienced worker is gone from a specific studio. They might leave the industry altogether. Imagine how many more buggy launches and failed promises are going to start popping up in games in two years when half the experienced people are gone. Even when I was in college, people told me that the average time for people to spend in games was five years, and then people either burn out or find something different that doesn't crush them. And so now, what impetus do people have to stay when it was already risky and now it's just even riskier? Because of consolidation and mass layoffs, gamers are going to see a decline in good quality games. Maybe, pressed to find the little amount of investment that is out there, Big studios will save money by crunching more projects, making more people work inhumane hours, and rushing more games that will inevitably get mocked mercilessly on the internet. There is one check on this mad dash to appease shareholders. Unions in March. So, 
as far as uh, these corporations are concerned, I say they need to be taken out of the hands of these shareholders. Um, they need to be taken out of the hands of these private investors. Because ultimately, it's not just the quality of the games that goes down. It's also workers' lives. Sega of America employees were the first group of video game workers at a major American company to win a union contract. They negotiated not just pay raises, but layoff protections. Workers at ZeniMax, makers of Fallout and the Elder Scrolls series, unionized in 2023. And while they're still at the bargaining table, they've already won concessions over the use of AI. The unions aren't going to stop the layoffs tomorrow, but on an individual, you know, like studio level, unions have helped people keep their jobs. Unionizing would absolutely make for better games. For starters, right now, individuals have very little power and whether or not you are actually replaceable, you're going to be seen as replaceable. To an executive, a game designer is a game designer. The amount of specialization involved between disciplines of design is not something that is understood at the corporate level. And in general, happier people, or at least people who are cared for and fulfilled in their basic needs are going to be more effective at their jobs. And a union is something that can absolutely help get people the basic dignity that they deserve in the workplace and in life. As for myself, I'll probably never see the resolution of the cliffhanger from last ASX, purely because some executive didn't like the way it looked on a spreadsheet and fired everyone working on it. And when it comes to workers like Colin and Alex, they just want to make good games. In Colin's case, he's now working on indie games he loves. I think if we are focused on making sustainable teams and making interesting art, the players will find it themselves. And if we are creating niches to be filled, then the niches will be filled. Now, while I do think that uh, unionization is a good thing, I feel like unionization does not go far enough. I think that workers need to own the company collectively. So gaming worker cooperatives should be more of the goal. Now, let's get into this because I was looking at the ownership of some of these um, of some of these games. And I was thinking about some of the biggest uh, video game studio mergers and acquisitions. And so let's take a look at this. So some of you may know some of these names. This is largest list of largest video game mergers and acquisitions. Uh, so one of the largest ones was Microsoft buying Activision Blizzard. And if I, am I tripping the, it, that, that's not $75 billion. That's not $75 billion. That cannot be $75 billion. No. I can see $7.5 billion, but not $75 billion. That, that can't be right. Right? Guys in the chat, please tell me. That's not $75 billion. Hang on. Am I seeing this right? Mm -mm. That can't be right. Because if that's actually $75 billion, that has to be a, a typo on Wikipedia. Please let that be a typo. Because if you're trying to buy Activision Blizzard for $75 billion, how much money does Microsoft have? That means Microsoft has already been a trillion dollar company. Activision tried to get Vivendi Games for 18.9 billion. Take-Two Interactive tried to buy Zynga for 12.7 billion. Tencent tried to buy Supercell for 8.6 billion. 
Microsoft again tried to buy ZeniMax Media for 8.1 billion. Activision Blizzard tried to buy King for 5.9 media. So these are some of the biggest. Look, Electronic Arts tried to buy Glue Mobile for 2.4 billion. And so these mergers and acquisitions really just lead to worse games, worse working conditions, and people get stiffed. Workers get stiffed, consumers get stiffed, everybody gets stiffed. This is another story that, that had came out last year about how SAG-AFTRA video games, uh, they try to make sure that people uh, combated the whole AI voiceover issue. So it says sat after leaders on how Hollywood studios could avert a video game strike and why the guild supports game developers unionizing. So it says sag after is trying to avoid another strike, but actors union nonetheless has many bones to pick with the video game companies and its latest contract negotiations. Among South Africa's key sticking points is trying to get the gaming companies to agree to protections on the ethical use of generative AI, which was one of the biggest issues. The union fought hard for its talks with TV and film studios last year. So what they could actually do is they, they could use AI uh, to produce video game character voices. They can also use AI to produce um images for video games which ultimately would just lead to uh no work for many video game developers and the developers would largely be just laid off it, it reminds me of what going on with a lot of people who are you know who do coding a lot of coding is now being given to AI systems and people who actually were doing coding when we were told, learn to code. Now you're getting laid off. You don't have a job no more. All that learn to code went nowhere. So they're trying to, they're trying to stave off that as well um and being that microsoft was one of the biggest uh mergers and acquisitions on the list it was the biggest merger and acquisition on the list i wanted to see who collectively owns microsoft well there's microsoft corporation common stock institutional holdings here it is so institutional holders, well, what do you know? As we always see, the biggest culprits at Vanguard, BlackRock, and State Street owning Microsoft. Any wonder why? So this, this is basically our lives where a handful of companies own everything. And so you got to look at it. You, it is dangerous for people like Larry Fink and Mortimer Buckley to have a say over every product in your life. Who's Larry Fink? Larry Fink is the CEO of BlackRock. Mortimer Buckley is the CEO of Vanguard. They don't want you to know who they are. They don't want you to know their names, but that's who they are. Most companies, most corporations, if you go into their ownership portfolios, you'll see BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street. They own a piece of every single company in the world virtually. 
And who are their CEOs? People like Larry Fink, Mortimer Buckley. Want to go into the tech? You go to people like Peter Thiel. And so those are some of the people who actually own everything. And one of the people, the game developers, was talking about how people lose their housing. I want to go to this. Because, of course, they're also not paying good enough because, or they have to lower the pay. Here's outreach from the National Low Income Housing Coalition. I'm going to come back to this for the next segment, too. But this is important. Here in Florida, it actually went up. You have to make $35.24 an hour just to afford a two-bedroom apartment here in the state of Florida. But you also have a lot of people who live in Silicon Valley that also may be working for game developers. So California, you have to make $47.38 an hour in order to afford a two-bedroom rental in California. What about Arizona? Arizona is pretty high. You have to make $32.70 per hour in Arizona. Video game developers are living on the coasts a lot of the times. Jersey, where I'm originally from, $38.08 an hour. Let's look at Massachusetts. Massachusetts is $44.84 an hour. Let's just say you you let's just say you live in, in Illinois. Well, you have to make $22 and set. I'm sorry, Indiana. Uh, ah, there you go. I don't know. You have to make $28.81 an hour just to afford a two bedroom rental. Washington State, you have to make $40.32 an hour. And so when these video game companies are laying you off, you really have no recourse. You have nowhere to go. And things are so expensive to the point where you're going homeless. Or if you're living on, if you're sleeping on somebody's couch, you are homeless. And so that's, the part where I think a lot of people need to uh, focus more on this, how capitalism really is destroying the gaming industry as well as people's lives, man. Now, I want to share this as well. This is one of the answers I think that is necessary. Let me enlarge this. Says the means of gaming production. Says fed up with toxic industry, video game workers are turning into a radical alternative. So this came out a year ago. Says on his office desk, Alexander Gavriluk keeps two figures, figurines: Vladimir Lenin, the Russian revolutionary, and Joseph Broz Tito, the former communist leader of Yugoslavia. Gavrilovic is the founder of the video game industry Game Chuck, based out of a tiny office cram in a computers with computers in Zagreb, the capital of Croatia. The company is organized around equity. Each worker earns the same salary and shares the profits of the games they create. All decisions are reached through anonymous voting on Discord. The 17 person collective recently voted to shorten work days from eight hours to six and nobody gets fired. They can technically vote people out, but they try not to quote. We wanted to show you that you don't actually have to work like everyone else to be successful. Gavrilovic's company is an outlier in the gaming industry known for its grueling hours, high turnover rates and worker discontent. Over the past five years, industry giants such as Activision Blizzard, Electronic Arts, and UBI Soft have faced lawsuits over mistreating their employees while grappling with the increasing unionization efforts. Since 2018, over 140 collective actions by game workers, including labor complaints at Nintendo, walkouts at Riot Games, and strikes at, at, at Blizzard have been recorded around the world. 
according to Game Worker Solidarity, a project that tracks labor movements in the industry. Small group of game markers is going even further. Rather than fighting for better conditions within existing workplaces and labor structures, it's trying to build new structures. The group hopes to set an example for the $882.9 billion gaming industry, but as it does so, it faces both difficult tasks at making decisions without centralized leadership and a lack of understanding from financiers. So some companies have kept executives, which are still in charge of high-level business decisions, but have otherwise adopted a flat organization, an organization model. Others like Game Chunk go further by introducing democratic decision-making through unionization, collective bargaining agreements that grant more rights to employees. As some reject the concept of having a boss all together, these companies are organized as worker cooperatives inspired by 19th century labor movements and socialist thinkers. This is what I'm talking about. Game developers need to collectively and democratically own the gaming studios that they operate. It should not be one person who really doesn't do any of the work to oversee the entire operations and who gets hired and who gets fired. That's not right. Because without them, without the developers, these gaming studios do not work. So therefore, they should be the ones who collectively own, operate, and get the profits from the games. So yes, while I think unionization is a step in the right direction, it is not the entirety of what needs to happen. The workers need to own the studios collectively. And so this is what needs to happen. You'll get a lot of people who may, you know, talk about, you know, these CEOs, how they're necessary. I, I beg to differ. They're not necessary because the CEO leaves. The game developers keep the, keep the company going. But if the game developers leave, I... So that's one of the biggest things, I think. And how do you get things like that? Well, you can push for ballot initiatives that force uh, companies to give right of first refusal. Like, for instance, when Microsoft tried to buy Activision, Activision should have been stopped by the government and should have given the employees of Activision right of first refusal. So the employees actually say, yes, we would like to buy Activision instead of it being allowing to be sold to Microsoft then that's what should have happened. Then the employees would have came together and then purchased Activision and then Activision would be owned by the workers. And the profits from Activision games would go straight to the workers instead of to shareholders. And the running of Activision would have been determined by, worker, by workers democratically. And that's how it should have been done. But because we have a system that thrives on exploitation and greed, that's not what happens. And then you get big corporations like Microsoft, which are collectively owned by Vanguard, BlackRock, and State Street. And they're able to absorb Activision Therefore, leading to less competition and less quality in the industry. So, this is why I say capitalism kills the video game industry. It's killing the entertainment industry, period. So, this is why if you are a video game you know, connoisseur, a gamer... Start looking into gaming companies that are also co-op run. And then start encouraging more gaming companies. If you know developers to, to try to develop 
gaming co-ops. Because I think ultimately that is what's best for all of us. It's best for the, for the workers. It's also best for you, the consumer. Because then the quality of your games that you'll be playing will be top notch. You won't keep it, continue to be stiffed by these corporate parasites. Thank you so very much for watching my channel, and I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfon. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much, and you can watch more of my content here. Mwah. More head kisses, and have a beautiful day.